Hey, what an incredible just moment we've been having with worship, and I got to tell you, uh, the Lord is just kind of moving on my own heart this morning, and, and I pray that uh, God's presence is evident there. Well, I hope uh, maybe you've got something nice and uh, delicious to be sipping on this morning. I hope you're settled in, you've got your Bible. We're going to jump into the Word. I, I just want to reiterate something that you just heard there, or maybe you're just tuning in and missed it. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And at 10 a.m., we're gathering with uh, four other churches plus others in our community for a drive-in Easter experience. And uh, it's at the hospital here in town in the parking lot between there and the business park. And so uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We hope you'll be there. It'll be a unique time together for sure. But the Easter, it matters. And the resurrection, it changes everything. And uh, we hope to see you next Sunday uh, in your cars, of course. Uh, worshiping with us ne- next week. Well, today we are wrapping up our Mindset Matters collection of sermons. Uh, and uh, today the mindset we want to look at is this, that we lead the way in joyful generosity and faith-filled stewardship. Now, that's a mouthful. I'll say it again, and then we'll unpack it today. We lead the way with joyful generosity. Turn to somebody and give them the cheesiest smile you've got. Go ahead, throw a little smiley face emoji in the chat box there. We lead the way in joyful generosity and faith-filled stewardship. Uh, I want to read a a scripture to you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 is where we're going to start. Colossians 3, verse 2, it says this. It says, set your mind... On things above, not on earthly things. Now, there's an understood you as the subject of that. I'm not a grammar Nazi nor a really proficient. I kind of have to grind away at grammar myself. But uh, that sentence, it's really about you. You set your mind. How do you set your mind? Well, the way you set your mind is to set your eyes in a direction. In other words, wherever you are looking... That is where you will be going. Your eyes often will determine where you're going. So we want to set our minds or set our sights on things above, not on things below. Today I want to speak to you on the, the title of the message is this, Set your sights. Go ahead, type it into the chat box. Uh, set your sights, set your sights, set your sights sights. Uh, Anybody remember uh, learning how to drive? Uh, I remember when I was learning how to drive and I had a tendency uh, when I was driving to uh, grip the wheel really tight, 10 and 2 of course, but I would grip the wheel really tight, Um, but I had a tendency to look like just at the front edge of the hood of the car, right? I was just looking like right out where I was And, and as a result I would kind of drift from side to side because my hands felt like they always needed to be moving otherwise I wasn't in control or something right and and I would just shift back and forth but because my eyes were like foot right where I was at as opposed to where I was going I tended to drive with more swerve it was less steady and it definitely was more stressful for everybody else in the car Uh, whenever your sights are set in the wrong place Whenever your mindset is positioned or fastened or or pointing in the wrong direction, when it's pointed on things below rather than on things above, the things of God, we have a tendency to see stress increase. Your sights determine your stress level oftentimes. Right now, we're living in a time where many of us, our sights are right here in front of us when it relates to the economy. You're watching it go up and go down, up and down. Many of you are facing and staring right in front of you job loss, lack of employment and income. And you're staring at it and all you see is the lack or the problem or the economics of it all. And stress is easy to come by. (laughs) Some of us, it's this sense of our health, right? Like we are staring at the health crisis and we can't really see beyond it. We don't know what's going to come. So we're not really trying to look beyond. We're just looking right now. and, And we're getting stressed out because you don't remember how many times you touched your face in the last 10 seconds. Like, did I touch my face? Did I wash my hands? Was it 20 seconds? Maybe it was only seven seconds. I got to go back and happy birthday this thing one more time. Or maybe you're just like, where's the hand sanitizer? Hand 
sanitizer and you're like just drinking hand sanitizer trying to keep healthy but it's just stressing because you're trying to keep your kids and people and this and that and when was the last time I Clorox my counter and it's right here and, and, and those are things we need to be aware of but if all we're doing is staring our sights right in front of us stress kind of grows for, for some of us, it's the education side of it. We're, we are now home educating our children. I was trying to help my son with math the other day, and I was like, son, I, I don't know what they're trying to do. We're going to have to figure this out together. And I, I, I caught myself thinking, wait a second, I'm getting stressed out over third grade math. This is a problem. Like, I got married to make children, not educate them. This is a problem. Uh, and the more we focus on what's right in front of us, oftentimes stress is our result. But the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians saying, hey, you don't have to set your sights on everything below. You can set them higher. You can set them beyond this. In other words, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we are not of this world eternity is written in your heart in, in other words eternity is etched it's tattooed it's stamped into your heart and my heart and and, it, and if eternity is stamped and etched in our hearts then there is a longing and a hope for eternity we have this eternal mindset within us that helps us look forward rather than consumed with what's here right now the the, the present circumstance stances they fail in comparison to the goodness that is is yet to come i came to tell some of you today that we do not have to live with fear now because we know the good that is coming later you don't have to live with fear right now you can set your sights on something eternal, something that lasts forever, something that doesn't change with the season, something that doesn't change with the temperature, with the culture, and with viruses. It's unchanging. It is the, the truth that God says eternity is written in our hearts. In other words, you were designed and created with a longing for forever. And the way we live forever in good things is through Jesus Christ. Christ we can have this eternal mindset we don't have to live with fear now because of the good that we know is is to come now here's, here's the beauty when when you live with an eternal mindset rather than an earthly mindset that doesn't mean that we live with disregard to the things that are here and now no we actually want to care for the things that are here and now knowing that how we care for them now prepares us for what comes later uh, the Bible uses this word, and, and we don't really use it in our language much, but it uses this word stewardship. I, in other words, when you have a mindset and you set your sights on eternal things, things that last eternally, when you take a long obedience approach to your life and my life, when your mind is looking long-term eternally, then you are living like a steward. Stewards think long-term. Now, let me define this word stewardship for us. Stewardship is simply this. It's taking care of what's not yours like it was yours. Stewardship. It's taking care of what's not yours like it was yours. It's, it's keeping it healthy, multiplying or increasing, and growing for the future. That's what stewardship is. It's healthy. It's growing. It multiplies. And you're taking care of what's not yours as if it was yours. That's stewardship. Now, let me just say it this way. If the things in your life that have been given to you, the responsibility, your things that you're caring for in your life, your family, finances, your health, your, uh, your home, uh, the, the animals in your life, right? like, like the earth itself, like everything that is in your, your skills, your talents, your abilities, all of the things that God has given to you, they are yours to take care of. And if there is anything that is unhealthy, if there is anything that is not growing, if there's, not any, if, if there's any area in your life where it's not increasing, I, I, I need you to understand today, you're not being a good steward in that area. I, I know that's kind of like an ouch moment, but the reality is we have to have this sober uh, awareness to see clearly so that we can set our sights in the right place 
it's likely that if you're not being a good steward, then your sights are set in the wrong place. You're looking at it maybe wrong. And anything that is growing and healthy and flourishing, well, then that's an indication that you are stewarding it well. It, a lot of you would say that like a steward would be a manager. I, I, would, I would argue that it's a little bit different than a manager, just making sure everything is maintained. I would say it's more like a franchise owner. Somebody who recognizes that ownership and the success, it's kind of on them. They want to grow that store. They want to grow that franchise. Uh, but they're not the inventor or the owner of the franchise. There's a corporation. There's something bigger than them that they're accountable to. You and I have been given this life. You've been given gifts, talents, abilities, family, relationships, finances, opportunities. And the way you take care of them like it was your own determines whether or not you are positioning yourself for more for not see because the blessing of being a good steward is that you get more to steward uh, think about it like this when uh my kids uh, uh, right now i'm teaching my kids how to drive our golf cart right and i'm dealing with the whole thing you got to look in the set your sights out there buddy you got to look out there don't look right in front of you look where you're going not where you're at we keep talking about that but it wasn't they had to first learn how to ride their bike and drive their bike, now they're learning, when, they, when they've learned that, then they get to learn how to drive the golf cart. When they've learned how to drive the golf cart, the next thing they get to, the, their responsibility increases, they get to, to ride the, the riding lawnmower, right? They get to do some lawn mowing, praise Jesus, right? Because they, they've, they've earned that, they've, they've been proven as faithful stewards, and then eventually they're going to get to learn how to drive a car. If they can't handle the golf cart, if they couldn't handle their bike, if they couldn't handle the lawnmower, then they're not going to be able to handle my car, which means they won't ever really be able to handle their own car. See, the reward for good stewardship, where you set your sights on things that are to come rather than the only here and now and being consumed is the responsibility. It's blessing for more. But if you're going to be a good steward with your sights for the future, when you set your sights on things above, then you can be a good steward. But being a good steward requires faith. Why? Because faith-filled stewards are marked and known by generosity. If you're going to be full of faith, then it helps you to steward you, you, you see things correctly. You're setting your sights on things above, not on things below. That's a good steward. You will be marked and known by generosity. Uh, the way we steward, how we steward is with faith and generosity. That's how. We all steward different things. Like the what of your stewardship is the reality of your faith. Your marriage is different than my marriage, right? Like your financial realities might be different than mine. Uh, your abilities and skills are different than my abilities and skills. Like you've been giving different things to steward, but how you steward them, how I steward them is exactly the same. How do we steward them? With faith and generosity. Did you know that there are over 500 verses in the Bible uh, all about faith. 500 verses about faith. There are 500 verses about prayer. Now, if somebody were to tell you something and to talk about something 500 different times, don't you think that's a little bit important? Don't you think that that's something that like they really are trying to get you to understand? Yeah, I definitely think that. Now, don't just buckle your seatbelt for a second. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what's in God's word. There are over 2,000 verses on the subject of money, on the subject of generosity, on the subject of tithing, on, on the subject of how you handle money. One out of every 10 verses in the New Testament alone deal with money. 25% of all of Jesus' teachings are about money. Wouldn't you think that money is kind of an important thing to Jesus, to God? Like, like there's something important. Why? Because God uses money as real life indicators for our ability to steward. In other words, how you see money is dependent on how your sights are set. Are they set eternally or are they set on things below? I want to I share uh, some, some things today, two marks of a, of a generous steward. Two, two things today, but I want to do it in the backdrop of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we find one of 
these teachings from Jesus on the subject of money and generosity. And, and, and I want to say from the onset, my goal today is uh, not to take an offering, right? Like, that's not my goal. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things that you would be aware of as our, at our church is we rarely talk about offering and giving. It's not like an every week thing for us. Uh, in fact, we don't even pass a plate when we're together. No offering bags that are like hopefully magically multiplying things or buckets. We don't, we don't pass anything. In fact, we have giving boxes and the opportunity for you to give online. Why? Because if you want to give, you can give. Because I think it's an it's a indicator that you're seeing things and you're setting your sights in the direction of being generous. And, you know, Jesus, anytime he talked about money, he didn't automatically take an offering right after either. He would talk about money and uh, then move on. But he wouldn't be like, now we need to raise some money. Uh, now that we've talked about money, we need to raise some money. I need a new chariot with some more leather seating, some first-class seating, leather seats that'll get me to the outer regions much faster. I need a, a faster chariot jet. Like, like he didn't do that. He didn't use money to manipulate, but he did use money as an illustration for something more. And I want us to look at it together in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. These are the words of Jesus. Do not store up for yourselves treasures, notice this, on earth. Set your mind, set your sights on things above, not on the earth below. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where and thieves could break in and totally steal it, where you could fall for a digital scam where you're supposed to buy a bunch of gift cards for a king in Nairobi. Like, don't store up treasures on earth, but instead, look at the contrast, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, eternal things, where moth and rust can't break in and steal it. Listen to this, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Your heart always follows your money. What you treasure the most is where your heart goes. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you um, is darkness how great then is that darkness no one can serve two masters uh, in other words you could nobody can ride two horses with one backside like it just doesn't work you can't serve two masters because either you will hate one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both god and and money you can't serve both god and money in the chat right now i want you to, to 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 type out pick a horse go ahead tell them pick a horse pick a horse you only can ride one at a time pick a horse pick a horse and make spell make sure you spell it correctly pick a horse i want to i want to share two marks of a generous steward with you because generous stewards have their sights set properly and remember, when your sights are set in the right place, eternal versus earthly, then stress is not your reality. Setting your sights in the right place helps your heart. Number one, it's this. Here's the first mark. Generous stewards understand it's not really about money. A generous person, a person with a generous heart, a life of generosity they understand it's not actually about money. It's not. In fact, Jesus tells us it's not. He tells us it's actually about your heart and other people. That's what generosity is really all about. It's about your heart and it's about people. I know some of you were bracing for me to start talking about money and all these other, like, no, it's really about your heart and generosity is really about other people. If we're gonna be joyfully generous, it's about our heart and other people. Think about it like this. Uh, is your heart gracious or is it full of gripe and, 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 and complaining? What's in your heart? Is your heart sincere? Is it gentle? Are you humble or are you full of pride? Uh, is your heart pure? That's what a generous heart looks like. It's, it's fully pure. It's always gracious to other people. It's, it's humble in its approach. That's, 
That's the heart that God is, is after. Is, is, is the way you treat other people, is it kind? Like, like when somebody's taking too long at the grocery store, when they get your order wrong at the drive through do you respond with kindness or do you respond with something else? See, because a generous person responds with, with kindness. You're just kind to everyone. There is no limit to your, you're just going to keep being kind and kind and gracious and compassionate. It's just over, that's a generous heart. A generous heart is, is patient with other people. A generous heart is encouraging of other people, not stingy with their compliments, but like always giving compliments to somebody else. Not like lying and manipulating to them, but like genuinely being complimentary to somebody else, like if you have a heart that is generous, if you are a good steward, then your heart will be generous. And when your heart is generous, then you are kind, you are patient, you are encouraging. Listen, you forgive. Forgiveness is for giving. Some of you are so stingy in your heart because you are refusing to give forgiveness to somebody else who's wronged you. And in that area, there is stress, there is anxiety, there is something blocking the life that God wants to give you because, man, you're just being stingy with your forgiveness. We don't need to be stingy with something that God was so lavish and abundantly good to give us. That's why Jesus taught us to pray earlier in Matthew chapter 6 that we can forgive those as you have forgiven us. There is this sense that giving forgiveness is the mark of a generous heart, a generous person. Are you generous with your thoughts towards other people? Or are you kind of like really reserved and hesitant and negative? Are you, are you good with your words? Are you generous with your time to other people? Are you generous with your stuff, letting other people benefit when necessary? Are you generous with, don't miss this one, are you generous with your attention right now? Like, like, there are a lot of distractions that you could still be having, but there's a lot of distractions that are gone. Generosity isn't about money. It's not really about money. It's really about your heart and other people. So when you're in a conversation, are you fully present in that conversation, or are you thinking about the next thing? Are you really listening, or are you just waiting to respond in some way? Are you generous? <laughs> let, me, let me throw another one out to you. Are you, when somebody else uh, asks for prayer, are you quick, uh, or do you only ask, let me say it this way, I messed that up. Do you only ask people how you can pray for them because you are looking for them to ask you the same question? Are you manipulating praying for others to get them to pray for you? That's not a generous heart. Your sights are set in the wrong place. I think the mark of a generous steward is that we understand that it's not really about money. Somebody put it in there. Generosity is not really about money. It's about your heart. It's about people. I love some of the acts of generosity that we've seen during this COVID-19 crisis that our world is in. We've had some families in our church get together with other of their family members, and the kids like wrote cards, and they put together goodie baskets to take to hospitals in the, our local area to the ER staff to the nurses and doctors just to encourage them and it was an act of generosity that really was about their heart being in a place and it was about other people it wasn't about the things it was about the act of generosity uh, I, I heard recently about a story of an older priest in Italy who, who contracted uh, the virus, and there was another young man who contracted the virus as well, but they didn't have enough ventilators for both, so the priest gave up his ventilator to the younger man. Why? Because it was an act of generosity. It was an act of a generous heart. It didn't involve money. It was an act of generous, because generosity isn't really all about money. It's actually about your heart and other 
people. Uh, I've heard, we've heard stories about younger people shopping for older people. There are businesses giving great discounts for people who need certain things to, to, to operate at home. Uh, other people giving assistance. We as a church, because of your generosity, we were able to give $1,000 this last week to one of our local outreach partners, The Beacon, so that they can continue to give food to those who need it. We get to be generous. We do it with joy because it's not really about money. It's about our heart. And our heart is joyful. Our heart is alive. I think a mark of a good steward, of a generous steward, of a faith-filled generous steward is that we realize it's not about money. It's not really about money. Here's number two, the second mark of, of, of a good steward, of a generous steward, and that's this. They understand how to actually look at money. They understand how to see and look at money. Did you find it interesting that in this passage in Matthew chapter six, Jesus was talking about treasure, then he gives an optometry lesson followed by more economics. Like why in the middle, two money talks smashed in the middle was a talk about your eyesight. Like I don't really, two at one of these things just doesn't seem like it belongs. Uh, Unless you really begin to dig in and look. See, it's your eyes that allow light to come in or allow darkness to come in. Might I suggest that what Jesus was getting at for you and I is he's saying, uh, what's your sight set when it comes to your money? How do you look at money in your own life? Is it set on eternal or is it set on the here, the now, the immediate, the earthly, the the selfish? You've probably heard the old cliche like, you can't take your stuff to heaven, right? Like you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul because it all stays here. But you know what you can take to heaven? People. You know what does go to heaven? The character of your heart. Those things are eternal. I think Jesus was helping us to understand it wasn't really about literal eyes, but more about the sight of our heart and how we view money. Are we closed-fisted or are we open-handed? Is it controlling us or are we using it to contribute to a healthy life? Uh, Let me give you three things that we can't afford to see money as. You can't afford to see money as God. Money is not God. It's not. God does use jobs and other monies to be a resource to you, but hear me clearly, friends, God is your provider not your job. Your job is just a resource to get you from the source to your hands. You have to set your sights to see your job, to see provisions as not God, but a resource from God. God is your source. Money is not God. You can't look at money. You can't see money. You can't set your sights on money to where you think money is mine. Mine, 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 mine. No. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, the earth is the Lord. And everything in it belongs to him. Like everything belongs because a good steward recognizes I don't own it, but I get to take care of it. I don't own it, but I get to use it as a a resource to represent the kingdom of God. Proverbs says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Money isn't God, money isn't mine. And, and, and lastly, money, isn't, it, money is, is not bad. Money is not bad. But it is a bad master. Jesus said, you can't give all of your affections. You can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and money. I can't serve both God and money. I'm either going to love one and really kind of despise and get distracted by the the other, kind of push the other with disregard, or I'm going to fully be devoted to one and hate almost wells up on the inside of us. Money is a bad master. And when you are mastered by money, you know what happens? You live with a scarcity mindset. Your sight, your lens is tuned and filtered to scarcity. 
See, when you're a slave of money, when you are really worshiping money, when you're pursuing, when money becomes your God, when money, you think money is yours, when your sight is set to think that, that, that money is kind of your master, and you don't even know that you do it, but, but here's what happens. You begin to live with a sense of con- a controlling spirit gets in your heart. You begin to manipulate others. That's a scarcity mindset. You begin to live with fear. That's scarcity. Let me, let me ask you this question. Do you get upset at your children for not eating all of the food on their plate because you are trying to teach them to be a good steward or because somewhere inside of you, you are scared that there might not be food later? Did you grow up with this sense that like, like if, I, if we don't eat it all, if we don't take care of it, if we don't eat it all, then all of a sudden we're not going to have something later? Like, that's a spirit of fear. That's a scarcity mindset. That's setting your sights. That's looking, letting the eyes of your life see money in the wrong way. I've told you the story before of how I used to uh, split pieces of gum because I was afraid that I would eventually run out of gum and not have any more gum. Like silly. I want to challenge you. Is the stress that you're feeling about the economics possibly because you're living with a scarcity mindset? When you live with this scarcity mindset, when you are serving money, this spirit of mammon is the actual word here. Instead of money, it's mammon, which is kind of a spirit of the age, a, a, an understood kind of uh, concept, if you will. And, and when that is the case for our lives, blame shifting begins to happen where we blame our money situation on our life situation. Listen, money isn't bad. In fact, God tells you, you need to, Jesus tells you in this passage, you need to store up treasure. It is wise to store up treasure. But you can't store up treasure on earth. Don't set your sights on things below. Store up in heaven. Do something that's eternal with your generosity. Do something that's really going to outlast your life with your generosity. Set your sights on things above. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. It's all about how you view the money. The generous steward understands it's not really about money. But the generous steward understands how you are supposed to set your sights, how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to view money. Listen, the the entirety of Matthew chapter 6 is really about Jesus introducing an upside-down view of life, a new paradigm for people who are going to follow him. As a follower of Jesus, God wants you to live with a different mindset as it relates to the kingdom. See, the kingdom of God is all about looking at life differently, setting your sights in a different place, not on earth, but towards eternity. And that's why Jesus tells us to think and look differently than our culture. That's why we give instead of live greedy. That's why we fast instead of living with gluttony and being controlled by food. That's why we pray because we have a God who wants to talk to us, not be distant from us. We don't worry about tomorrow because God is already in our tomorrow and he's a loving father that tells you, you don't have to worry, I am with you. I see you and I am for you. That's the beauty of the kingdom of God, friends, is that we get to set our sights towards heaven, towards eternity, rather than getting stuck on earth with what's here, what's now, what's screaming at us that's only building stress in us. Jesus is trying to teach us to set our sights differently to see money differently, to recognize that being a good steward and having a generous heart is about being, uh, is about people. It's about a heart above it all. My question to you is this today. How can you be generous this week? How can you be generous without money? And how could you be generous with your money? How could you start looking and recognizing that anything that is in your hands, your life, is yours to steward, to take care of, to make healthy, to grow. What is, how can you be generous without the money, not talking about money things, but heart and people things? And how can you be generous maybe with money? Uh, Here's the final thought that I have for us today, and that's this. Generosity always leaves a mark, but it never should leave a bad taste in somebody's mouth. 
Don't be generous and then attach strings to it. Don't be generous to manipulate. That's why we don't give to get from God. We give because we worship God. We give financially because we're obedient to God, not to like some uh, uh, profitable transaction back from God. Generosity ought to leave a mark. And when we live generous lives from our heart about other people, it makes a mark. It moves the gospel forward. It, It helps people understand the very nature of our God, his goodness but it should never leave a bad taste in somebody's mouth. John 3, 16 and 17, maybe you've heard these scriptures before. For God so loved the entire world that he gave his son, Jesus, that anybody who would believe in him didn't have to perish, but could have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, bad taste in your mouth, but rather through him, the world might be saved. The generosity of God gave us Jesus. It made a mark on humanity, it made a mark on history, and it's made a mark on my life, but it hasn't left a bad taste. Christian, Christ follower, is your life a generous life? Is it leaving a mark, or is it leaving a bad taste in somebody's mouth? Today is Palm Sunday. It's the day when an entire city gathered to celebrate Jesus' arrival, throwing palm branches down and doing some amazing acts of generosity where they would literally take off their coats, lay it down for him to walk on. It was an incredible act of generosity. Did it have anything to do with money? It had everything to do with honoring other people. They set their sights and they could see this king who was coming. Listen, when you and I, when we live generously, we get to put the gospel of Jesus on display. Your generosity and your life of generosity as a good steward helps you set your sight on eternity. It demonstrates the gospel to the world around us that when everybody else is stressing out, you are at ease. Why? Because your sights are in a different place. You're seeing it differently than other people are seeing Are we living in a time when it is kind of stressful? Yeah, we really are. But friends, can I encourage you today? Set your sight, set your mind on things above, not on the things below. And I believe that the God of peace will meet you right where you're at. Would you bow your heads as we close in prayer? If you're here and you would, listening to this you say pastor i want to be a generous steward and i want to set my sights this week on things above not below would you just in the chat room would you just kind of put a hand up maybe set an emoji or just type the word i'm setting my sights up go ahead just type i'm setting my sights up lord you see these commitments today where we're saying we want to set our sights up i pray lord that you would help us to know you, to see you, to set our sights in the, right, in the right place. And Lord, I pray that today, today, God, that you would uh, help us move forward. Lord, if there would be any here today that don't know you, may we recognize your generosity, how you gave Jesus to die for us. Lord, we want to serve you, we want to pursue you, and we want to follow after you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in. We can't wait. Share this with somebody so they can catch it. Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link and when you do that you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them hey if faith church has made an impact in your life if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith would you consider partnering with us financially when you do that it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real jesus You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If you're 
If you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.